Hey. Hey, Lamau. I'm just gonna. Anyways, hello, chat. Hello, everyone. It's been up. What's going on? Oh. My, my friends made me play League of Legends and I got the best champion in the first capsule. There is no best champion. Oh, oh, it does it show Sonic Lost World in the description? God, my PC is fucking up. What's happening? Please tell me it shows Lost World in the description. Just please tell me that. Please tell me it shows Lost World in the description. Whoops. Sonic Run Amazing Adventure Worlds? What? This game. Sonic Run Amazing Adventure Worlds. What even is it? Holy shit, you guys want some some mind fuck? Oh, I was gonna do a thing. Never mind. I'm still on the starting screen soon. Uh, starting screen. Starting screen. Starting soon. Screen. <laughs> so, I'm gonna be here for like five minutes and then we're get, gonna get ready to start. Alright, so, just as, just as a heads up, today I'm gonna be continuing the level design and first things first, I'm gonna make a tile card for the stage. Just so you guys know how that shit, that stuff's done. And that, that wasn't in the previous version of, of uh, Not So Simple World, so it's gonna be in this one now. There's several ra ways to do a tile card, but I'm gonna be doing that. I'm gonna be just talking about enemy placement and the flow of the level design itself and how you need to make sure that it's right and platform placement and everything related to level design. So yeah. Sonic Bizarre Adventure Stardust Runners. <laughs> Yay. <sighs> Alright, let me just see how many people are here. It's the ball 19, just what I had before, really. Hmm, so how long have we been going on? It's a bit long. Alright, let me just just things oh it's it's a mobile game oh my god okay it's time for me to move away from this view hold on and stop there we go hopefully you guys can see it and there we go what even is this this is like asset flip per asset flip. Oh my god. Like those things are not even from a Sonic game. And this Sonic's probably just fan art. Adventure World Kids! <laughs> contains ads, of course. It contains ads. Of course. Of course. Oh, oh yeah, you guys wanna see a mindfuck? in the OBS window. That's fun. It's always fun to do. Anyways, we're about five minutes in. It's about time to start. Uh, t tell me about the volume. Can you guys hear the music? Is the music volume okay? If it is or not, I don't really know. But... I think it's about time we, we start messing with this shit and just going. So, alright, let's go. So, this is how we left off yesterday. Our level starts over here with Sonic in the beginning of the stage. And then the stage sort of just goes up a little bit. Other, as There's like a little bit of a platform over here. And that's the thing you want to do in your level design. Try your best 
to not make your level design just a straight line. Add some variation, add some things you have to do. For example, over here, you fall down, and after you fall down, you gotta jump over here and then go through this ramp. Like, for example, over here, it's kind of a straight, but there is a slope, and there is a split in paths, and there's another split in paths over here, which I showed in the stream last time, that you can actually jump from here to here. You can actually do that. So, yeah, so far, let me just cover empty space so people don't see it. And just remember everything from the previous lecture if you can. <laughs> that will come in handy. So, okay. Okay, so we have a little problem. Uh, last time we, we made a uh, play around with this, Sonic can't really reach this place over here. So, what, what can I do for this? Well, there are several ways you can do that. You can either play some platforms over here, something like that. So, Sonic will jump into it and then go over there. Or you can have a hidden spring somewhere down here that will lead your player over there. Or a spring on the wall over here that will just put your player over here. Something like that. Something like that. Several ways you can do that and just make, in, in general, creative level design. What? Someone's saying that this, is, this, is, this isn't Undertale music. This <laughs> it's kind of Undertale though, but it's not Undertale. Uh, anyways, so we can do several things in order to do that specifically, but in this case, we can just use some platforms, which are uh, 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 an interesting way of doing it. I was gonna use a moving platform, but this would do as well. You just do that. But now let's let's use a moving platform, and let me use this time to explain you how the moving platform works. So where did you leave our previous level? It's somewhere around here. I'm pretty damn sure. And yeah, there we go. Now that we have replaced every single thing, like everything looks all fucked up, but it's fine. So okay, here we have two platforming objects, two platform objects. So we're just gonna get them and move to where we had our stuff. Like we just keep our stuff in here, we keep it in here. Remember that every, there's, that's why you get two moving platforms here. This moving platform moves up and down and this one also moves up and down. But let me explain why they are kind of different. Let me just show them how those two work. So if you put them over here and you look into them, right, oh, they're both the same, what the fuck? Well. That was unexpected, no. Okay, let me just do this then. So I can show them why. I kind of spoiled it. It's not fun. Now we can look at them and see what they do. Now we can see that they are moving in separate directions. They still do the same movement, but they move in separate directions. Okay, let me try my best to explain how those variables work. There is a better explanation by someone who actually understands them in uh, the Sonic World's Guide. But here's the gist of it. Okay, so over here in the corner, we got several things. And I'm gonna be using those to to, uh, to explain why. I, I wish I could zoom in. Can I zoom in? Can I do that with zoom? Oh. Oh, I have that thing. <laughs> It's like a, a Windows ac a accessibility feature. Oh, there we go. This looks a little bit too zoomed in, though. Oh man, this is this is very awkward. But it should do it. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Oh my God, can I like adjust this thing? Can I can I release it? Can it get out of my mouse? What? What did I do? Oh no! Oh wow, this is interesting actually. Are you guys okay with this? <laughs> oh my god. Oh man. W what can I do in this thing? Oh, I can invert the colors. Yes, of course. Oh, thank God, I can make it into a square. All right. If we just click this minus button. This is weird. I don't like it. But anyways, okay, so here, uh, I can click on the platform. 
This is so weird. You, you want full screen? Vara, don't fuck with me. Oh my god. Oh my god. It affects both of my monitors. I fu I fucking hate it. You can you can I can even sort of move myself into the other monitor and show you guys the chat. This is amazing. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> okay, here we go. I hope I can do it. <laughs> okay, so there we go. Got a moving platform over there. If we go over here in the in the values, I can show you what the moving platform does exactly. But before I do that, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go in here in events. And as you can see, we got qualifiers. And those qualifiers are one, two, and six. What do they mean? Well, uh, as far as I know, two just means that there is no angle being detected on it. So if you want to make an active and you don't want angles to be detected in that active, all you do is that you add a 2 to it. And so Sonic will remain standing up in that active and angles will not uh, do anything, essentially. And in 6, uh, 6 is essentially the moving platform qualifier, so anything that has the 6 qualifier in it will act like a moving platform, whether it is a moving platform or not. Essentially, it's going to act activate like the first couple of variables over here and it's just gonna use those right and one it's it's a platform essentially you can jump from down here and up here that's really it right so all right so let's go over here in values and I can see several values what do those values mean well uh, the first one being initial angle X and initial angle X I'm not really sure what it does but I think it's supposed to be the... Okay, so here's how the moving platform works. It, it works via things like sine waves and cosine waves. And what a sine wave is, is... Remember when we went into LabChirp and we saw those those waves just went up and down, up and down. And, oh my god, get out of here. Get the fuck out. Uh, you, you had those waves that just went like this. Okay, so essentially... If I just get a place place on the screen I can draw and I just have like a sine wave it's essentially like the, mo the moving platform just moving up and down and it moves like this like when it gets to the top it doesn't move as much as when it gets it's like just by moving or whatever and it uses this sine wave and I believe it uses a cosine wave to move uh, the platform from X or Y or something like that oh yeah there's a cos or sin uh, variable over here and I think one means that it's using sin and zero means that it's using cos and basically in a little graph oh, god damn it in the little graph here will be the sine wave and here will be the cos cosine wave as far as I can tell this is how it goes so essentially if you want a platform if you want two platforms and you want them to move in two different ways, you make one a sine and another one a cosine. So let's try it. Let's just have this one. Okay, so it changed the distance to minus 32, which is, you know, a way to do it. So let me just change instead to cos. Let me see what happens. There we go. It has the same effect. Oh, wow. It's actually a little bit different. Huh. Okay, then fuck this. I don't actually understand moving platforms. <laughs> But here's the trick, basically. Just keep every other variable where it is. Do not change an, any other variable aside from distance y and distance x. That is all. Okay, so example. Let's make distance x 32 and distance y 32. And if you click on play, now we see that this platform moves in a circle. Right, just don't change anything, leave it as is or just, you know, set everything at the start just like it is over here and probably nothing will happen. Let me check if I set this thing to zero. Let's see, wanna see what happens. Oh, there we go. That's what happens when you have a, an object moving uh, up and down in using sin in both of them. 
And if you don't know what sin and cos are, it's you're gonna learn this shit in math class in school. It'd be fine, just don't touch anything yet, yeah, pretty much. Just don't fucking touch anything. Except for those two things, and it'd be fine. So, uh, I think Spazzy was on, uh, on, on Hedgeland, and he he showed me a thing that he wanted to, to create. And I'm, you know what? Let's try making that thing before we make the tile card, just so we can get an introduction to moving platforms. Okay, so here we got, have a moving platform, and by the way, several bosses in before the sequel and after the sequel are just a, an agglomeration of moving platforms. There's nothing more to them, there are just a whole bunch of moving platforms. And if you program a moving platform to act like a boss, it will. However, the position of the platform is being set by the by you know a mathematical function. That means its initial position is like vital to it. So if you want to change the position of the moving platform, well done. <laughs> Just keep it as is. I can teach you how to make you uh, you making your own moving platform on your own. It's actually not very hard, surprisingly enough. You know, unless you want this very advanced thing. So let's let's make this into uh, something that could resemble a platform. This, obviously. Uh, but let's edit it a little bit using our little. Multimedia Fusion 2 editor. We can just grab colors and do a little spriting. Not very hard. So, you can just do that. Just adding a little bit of padding to the bottom, just make sure it's actually like floating, something like that. And in the first flame, I'm gonna paint it like purple. Not purple, uh, yellow it should be enough. You make it 100, you lower down the opacity, and there you go. And you just go and make sure there's no loop looping. It just stays there. Good. So now we have a moving platform. There's always the name moving platform 01. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have this thing move in circles around a middle point. Around here. We're gonna have essentially... What about the sniping too? I don't have to do this, I have it over here. So... What they're gonna do is they're gonna have a platform that moves around in circles and there's gonna be like things around it that are like moving it across as well alongside the platform. Just like in regular Sonic games. Just so it feels a lot better. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna put this thing in the center and we're just gonna leave it there for now. Uh, we can tweak the distance a little bit and make it like 40 to 40. 40 pi this, those are pixels by the way. Uh, Hmm. Yeah, I, th I believe there was a way of making them go faster, and I think you use angle step. So th I guess you just set it to two, and then they, uh, it'll move twice as fast. I don't exactly remember. So, yeah, I guess so. Now you can see it moving just a little bit faster. Alright, so we're gonna put it a little bit downwards a little bit, and then we're gonna make it 50. And fifth, Master X the marvelous stage. Is this ironic? <laughs> it's just a dumbass stage I made in like a couple seconds. The physics feel a bit off. Yeah, that's because they're different. Uh, anyway, so all right over here now we need a middle object, like an in-between object, like one of those. Where did my snip into go? You know, this thing. Selected, we have this thing and this thing and the platform, and it's spinning. I'm gonna have a, something in the middle too, but we need those things. So, well, what? What can we use as that thing? Oh, we ain't, we ain't got much, to be really honest. Um, we can use one of those things. So here's something that we can do. We can just go over here. Select to the selection and click crop, crop. just like before. M make sure you set the this thing into the right spot. Sometimes there is no middle point. There's no exactly middle point that you can put this on, so just put it somewhere. And just like that one, I'm gonna make it yellow like this. Here's the thing though, I don't want to collide with this thing. So far it has the qualifier one and two, so we can just delete those two. And it'll be fine. Oh, and by the way, 
those objects right over here, those things that we use for the angle, they have a qualifier too as well. They are literally just an object with no collision that has the qualifier in there. That's all that those things are. So in this thing, we can just set it to a fraction of our value. For example, we can set it to 30 and to 30 again. And we can clone this object. Let's click on the clone button, right click clone. And you gotta leave them in the center as well. So, um, just set it to 15, 15 or something like that. Not sure if those var variables are just right, but may or may not be. Make sure everything else is right, as, as, except for distance. Everything needs to be mostly the same. And since this ob object is different from this one, as you can tell by the name, this, this is Moving Platform 4 and this is 3, we probably need to change the color a little bit. Th in this case, I'm just going to make this one a little bit more yellow. Just so we know we're working with a different object. And for the middle, middle point, I might as well just make it into a small backdrop. So one thing that we can do is select this thing, copy, make it into a backdrop. And we can go over here and rename it to just object plant something. And we can just click on new, add that thing, and then bam, crop it. There we go. We can put it over there. We cannot we can't see it because it's a backdrop. And one thing that we can do is like we can copy this thing and put it down here. If we do that, now we have a quick access to all of our moving platform objects. Right? And if move this thing down here, we can have that thing over there. Another thing that we should do is that we should make another copy that is the, the quote unquote prefab of the moving platform where we can just select the whole thing and copy and paste it over there. Like anywhere around the stage, for example. So over here, we can just copy this and paste it right there. So let's go. Let's use it over there. There we go. Now, as you can see, the values are a little bit wrong and it's in the front and front as well, which isn't, which isn't great, but it works for the most part. This, this is how we do that thing. You just need to tweak things all right and make sure that they work. In fact, I want to make this thing spin a lot farther than the player. And the way you make this above the player and not behind, I think that we can do is just select both of them in order to back. And just select those two in order to front. And there we go. So in this object, we can go ahead and change this to something like 70, 70 pixels. Yeah, now there we go. You can see that going over there. It's just a several moving platforms. That's all that it is. That's it. And it works. Right, and we, we could tweak it a little bit more, just making it a little bit more advanced, but we don't really need to right now. In fact, because we're going to be adding a tile t uh, title card, and make sure that we are on the one of the upper layers in this case. I'm going to be doing it on top of the fade out. There's a fade out on top of here, there's a black uh, screen, and in this case, this black screen, if we go over here, it doesn't have follow the frame. That means it's always there, and we, when we start the stage, it fades in. So we're going to do the, the thing before the level starts. So let's save. Let's go into Photoshop and let's make our little tile card. I you, you could be using paint for this, but eh. Uh, someone said that I almost hit 5,000 subs. Is that... Holy shit, what happened? Is this normal? Oh, anyways. It's 5,000 subs good? I don't even know, dude. Like, I think Mega G Wolf has like a shit ton of subs, but like no views in his videos. The subs don't matter anymore. The world has changed. So, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna make our image the same resolution as our game. And how can we do that? Well, I have a little trick, at least for Photoshop itself. What the fuck? Oh, this is my dashboard. So, we can go over here. We can click play. And here, here's what you do. We click on, we click on our window. We press Alt and Print Screen. I, I think this only works for Windows, but essentially, we go over here in Photoshop. Now we click on New, and we already have the resolution of the game window, not the actual game, just the game window. So now we have the game in all its glory. 
in a little window. Uh, I wish I could work more. So we're gonna make this darker or lighter. Doesn't really matter. Let's make it lighter, just so we know what we're doing. And I think I might add just one piece of the background. I'm not really sure. Okay, so basically we need to add a zone name, and we can just use any font. Uh, I think I'm gonna. Which font should I use, really? I got the Sonic font, but it had the Sonic Heroes font as well, but I forgot the name. You can just literally use any font. This music needs Sega Sonic. That's a little green. Alright, so as you can see, there's a little problem. It's aliased. That ain't good, but what I can do to fix that is to go over here and put none. The aliasing isn't the best, but it, it, it'll work for most intents and purposes. So we can make this white, I'm gonna make this white. And then, one thing that we can do is that we can go over here and let me just add a little space into it. We can change this thing. Let's put it on auto. Or six. A couple of pixels. I just have everything set up over here. But this is the the text tab, and I think you could just go window, and then there's there is something over there. I don't know where it is exactly. There's character spacing and whatnot. We can adjust everything later because we're just gonna make this text not that. Okay, so we're just gonna. Right click the, the layer folder and click on the rasterize text. I don't know what's the name in English, but it's raster over here. So just raster it and it just becomes a regular image. Now that it's a regular image, we can adjust it on our own terms. So it's not so green zone. All right, so here's a couple of effects we can add to the image to make it fast. To make like a fast little thing. Okay, so when you double click a layer, sh this thing shows up. There's several options over here. There's this kind of garbage, but it usually doesn't work for pixel art and it makes your game look bad. But there are certain things you can do that won't your make it look bad, and one of them is projected shadow. And you don't do this, you just make the size as small as possible, and then you increase the distance, and then you change the angle. It can be anything you want. Now it's still pixel art, but it's not as horrible and you might might want to fix those middle points over here so it doesn't look as bad. Now let me see if I can get something else done with this thing, for example. Never really did it, per se. Huh. And have I haven't actually used anything to make it look like pixel art ever. Maybe I can do it. Oh, there we go. So now if we adjust the curves just right, you can get it to be like pixel art. <laughs> That's a bad idea. Should never have done something of this sort. Look at that. Oh, nice. Oh, there, it's still not fully though. So if you click over here and you make this curve as steep as we can possibly make. It'll become pixel art. In fact, I think we can add layers to it. As in tiers of steepness. Oh boy. Oh, that looks fancy. Maybe not. Maybe we can't do a thing. I don't think we can do a single thing. Okay. What is this Virtus? Huh. Well, there we go then. <laughs> Check it out. We had a little bit of a highlight over there by uh, slacking off basically. And I think this is the shadow color and you can change it. It's because you're gonna make it a light green. And keep the shadow in like greenish. Or the glare itself. Hey, what is this? Oh, this isn't that. 
Anyways, you can change the lighting as well, apparently. So... And it uses global lighting too, so... That's interesting. Huh. It's a very hacky way of doing this, but... You know what? It works. So, in the shadow, just make sure the in the blending mode you always set it to normal. That's the best thing you can do. So... Hmm. Is there a blending mode? Oh, there we go. It's normal. Eh. So now we can set the color right. Opacity, maximum. As in no opacity. Let's make it white. This is multiply, just make it normal. So let's make it... Right, and in the shadow, we can change the color of the shadow as well. It's over here. So we can make it the colors of simple worlds, essentially. So, yeah, then we can add... We can be a little bit cheap, duplicate this thing, and then just add a circle. There. Get ourselves a circle. Not so green zone! <laughs> yeah! Okay, so you might as well change the effect a little bit. Go over here, put it in an opacity or something like that. Yeah, check out my garbage! It's garbage! But yeah, I hope it, I hope I taught you something about this. It's one way of cheapening out of Photoshop and making those kinds of things faster. I've actually never done this. <laughs> I only used the shadow, uh, but now I just went and did this as well. So, and I cannot find a good color for this. There, there we go. Right, so we got ourselves the this thing. Okay, so if you make this thing transparent and it plays Control Shift E, we get ourselves an image. We could just go here and save. This is my different folder. And reference. And you can go over here and save it. So it'll save it with a very weird name. Anyways, this isn't it though. What we probably need to do. What the hell, OBS. Uh, we need to, uh, to also do is add an actual, like, you know one of those banners that shows up on the side? We can do one of those too. So let's try doing them. In fact, we're gonna do it just the other way, just like the other way, just cheapening out as much as we can. We're gonna use the polygonal selection too, this one. Just go... Just make, like, weird-ass thing. I can just paint this damn thing. There we go, and you copy and paste it, flip it. And if we don't if, if we don't deactivate the effects by clicking here, then they will be applied when we merge the folders. So now we can just if we right click this thing, it has an effect, so we can copy the layer style and then paste the layer style. There we go. Another thing that we can do is that I think you can add a a pattern to it, and I already have several patterns I can use, like, you know, this shit. Doesn't seem to work. Surprisingly enough, because of this shit. Well, we can do it. <sighs> the majesty. Don't do that, though. Just add a checkerboard. I have a checkerboard pattern over there. If you don't know how to make patterns, I highly recommend you look them up. They're really useful. So now I have a checkerboard pattern. I also want to add a gradient. And here's a little tip and trick that I'm going to teach you guys. I'm going to add a gradient right over here. Let's see. Let's hope it works. So it's a gradient, right? It doesn't look good in pixel art for the most part. But here's what you can do. You can press Ctrl Shift E. And use. Let me. Just, no. Let me just extend this thing. Okay. We're going to get this thing. I'm gonna copy to a new new image. And in it we can cheapen out again. And we're gonna go in here. 
uh, modes indexed colors. And by doing so, by the way, click this thing selected, transparency, you gotta keep it selected. And now we can change the colors in a much better way, and there's several options we can use this. There's loco, there's principal, I don't know what the name is in English, but we can use several of them. And select which one do we think is better. I'm gonna go with selective, principal selective, and we can change the number of colors we, we might need. In fact, I know, I, I know for a fact Strife uses this a lot. So now we can change into 32 colors. Now we have a thing that looks like a gradient, but in fact, oh, this is in 43. So now it's only using 32 colors. Now we can also use some kind of, of D-during format. And there's several of them we can use. There's this one, it diffuses them. If we can actually look closer. No, I just, I just want to zoom in. Oops. Thanks. Go over here. Let's go with loco. 32. There's several several uh, pix, uh, dead area modes you can use. I highly recommend you don't use any of them. But here you go. We can go with pattern. We can go into blue noise. It's called blue noise for some reason. More like white noise and just diffuse. And here we can actually change the intensity of it. It's making like a hundred percent or like ten percent. We can change it. Let's keep it at ten percent. In fact. Now I have this image, and we can copy and paste it in here. And just check, and there we go. Now we can select all those and merge. Now we have a quote-unquote pixel art gradient. Oh, it's just noise in English? Yeah, it's called blue noise. In fact, there are several types of noises. There is white noise, there is brown noise, there is pink noise. I don't know why. White noise is well what you see on TV, it's static. That there's a reason why it's called called white. But you know. Alright, so we got a shitty ass title card over here. And we're gonna I save this one already. I need to save this one now. So I'm saving it off screen on my second monitor. Let's call it Title 2. Okay, so let's go ahead and do it. There's several ways you can do a title card. You can do a title card by not using uh, any any programming. You can do a title card by not using any programming the same way they did it on Sonic World. Not Sonic World. Uh, well, almost any program. You're going to need a little bit of it, but technically you don't need it. Or you can do a title card using some programming. I'm going to be doing both ways over here. First, I'm going to do it without using any programming. And the second, I'm going to be using a programming. So, okay. Uh, double click in empty space, add an active, and let's make this active. Not so green zone. Right, as you can see, this is a big thing. You can crop it. Don't need to crop everything, but just put it over here. Right. <coughs> ah, jeez. The line deeder, oh, well, Vada, it looks good on CRTs, but that's if you're using a CRT. Most Sonic Worlds games are probably not gonna run on a CRT. Like, that's an emulator thing, so... I don't know. I don't think that option exists by default. You're gonna have to use the other pixel art me method I used way before. It's one way of doing things. Anyways, okay, so let's call it something else. Let's go over here and let's call it a uh, tile name. And I'm just going to be using this thing just to demonstrate the way you can do it just by using a hotspot. So essentially I'm going to put the hotspot in the corner right over here. It moves the object as, as you can see but that's not the point. Just keep not so green in the middle. And of course we need to go over here and the little thing with the play and not follow the frame. If inactive it's far from the frame, no. Just click it here and deactivate all those options just so that shit doesn't happen. You can deactivate this as well, I'm not going to have a collision. Oh yeah, Vara, it's 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 because you you work on hacks and whatnot. So I know this is the it's a fan game excuse. It's not an excuse. It's it's a fan game. It's it's not going to be played. It's a Windows EXE. Most people don't have a Windows computer connected to a CRT, you know. Like, but a lot of people do have Genesis connected to CRTs. So it's different in that sense. You forget what I mean. Right, so over here we have the stop function, function animation, 
and we're gonna just animate the tile card moving. Here's what you do. We copy and paste this thing. You don't even have to, to be honest, but okay, so over here you can set the coordinates of the point, hotspot point. You can see it moving right over there when I change it. So what we're gonna do is that we need to by hand animate this point. And we could just set it, set this thing to minus like 100. But we need to keep our, uh, in, uh, our screen size in, in, in perspective. So we're gonna send it over to minus 300. Right, this is our target. This is what we want, this frame two over here. It's not gonna be frame two when you copy and paste this thing, but now it's gonna be 200 or 250. And this one, we can go for 200. So it's moving 50 pixels a second. 150. Now we can add 100. And that's that's why you say that making this thing is super easy because it is. Now we have a thing that just moves in. It moves from the left apparently. Not really sure. Yeah, it moves from the left. And then what we do is that we get this thing. We copy it several times so it stays there several times. And over here we just make it move to the side. But it's making 50. 100 and 150 200 250 it's boring though <laughs> it is boring and 300 and in the final frame we can literally just make it invisible just click on new over here clear it clears the image so now it shows up and it goes away in fact, in the ones that are in the normal position, we can just copy and paste them. So it shows up for a longer time. Not the most amazing thing in the world, but it'll do for several people. In fact, this thing. Check it out. I'm gonna show it in game. There it is. See? This is one way we can do a title card without using any programming whatsoever. Uh, this is how I did all title cards in Sonic after the sequel, by the way. It was suffering, <laughs> I think. I don't, I don't really remember. I'm going to have to look into it. I might have actually used programming at some point. I just said, fuck it. But, right. Let's not do that, though. Let's completely delete all of them and just make it using pro using programming. So, there are several ways you can do this. But I'm gonna use the... I'm not sure if this is gonna work exactly, but what I want to do is that I want to use the... Um, oh, it's, it's called the easing object, this thing. And I want to tell you guys how it works, and I'm not really sure if it works on objects that don't follow the frame, though. That's my, that's my tricky thing, but we might be able to do it that way. So here, we're gonna go into level objects, or anywhere, really. I'm gonna go into level objects, because it's... Hmm, I shouldn't go there. Let me just go into simple worlds and in special actions I'm gonna create a new group and it's gonna be special objects. And this is gonna be where I'm gonna put the title card insert group of events. Title card uh, not so simple. So we are a weird place to put it, but it should do it. Okay, so over here we're gonna go and start at the frame. I'm gonna go into this object and no, not this object. I'm gonna go into the easing object, this one, and I'm gonna go into move object. So now we're gonna click into the tile name and I'm just gonna leave this as this. Just don't mess around with anything, at least for the first movement. I'm gonna click OK. X coordinate, well, this is the positioning in space that the object's gonna move. But I want to move it relative to itself. So I'm going to go into the object itself. Where is it here? Position X coordinate. And I'm just going to type a number. It's going to be minus 320. And now enter Y, y coordinate. Well, you know, you always have to scroll down and like, look for the object. But you don't really have to do that. And in fact, I'm just going to click a random object. And I'm going to position Y coordinate. Like the zero, of course. And we're gonna go event loops and 10. So this means that for 10 frames, the easing object is gonna move that object 
to uh, its its own position minus 320. Now I can just, uh, you know, we set it to a different object over here. So what we can do is that we can click on this, drag it over here, bam. Right, so in the start of the frame, here's what's going to happen. Nothing, because for some reason it didn't work. This is right. Oh boy. Let me, let me put this thing over here. It's moving X minus 32 and a Y of tile. Alright, let's try it out again. Oh, okay. Okay. This ain't right. Can be plus, right? Mm, in fact, uh, he here's what what I uh, I was fearing is that it it doesn't work when the the thing is set to not follow the frame. Oh, why is, why is it moving that object? Oof. You always have to cycle through the whole thing. It's kind of awkward. All right, so let me test it. Yeah, it just disappears. Hmm. So what can we do? I actually don't know. Huh. Let me check out this object. Hmm. Reverse object, I never knew about this. So... Does it have anything that we can use? Man, I guess this shit just doesn't work. So, okay, we have another way of doing it. It's a traditional way. It's not the most effective way, but it does work. Okay, so let's start from scratch. Instead of start from frame, we're going to have an always. This always is going to be adding... Not subtracting. We're going to go click on this object, add add 1 to alterable value A. And by the way, you can you can use uh, alterable value A, B, C, D, and D. They just work normally just like any variable. Naming them is just for... Uh, just so we know where you know where you are. So I'm going to comment. I usually tend to do this a lot. So we know where we are. This is just a thing. Now, we're going to go over here. This object. I'm going to compare it to one of its variables. And in this case, if the variable is low, lower than 10, we're going to go into the object itself. I'm going to position, set X coordinate to any object because we're going to move that into it. It's going to be X coordinate minus, uh, I don't know, 5? If it's 5, it's going to be moving 50. Okay, it should be 20. All right, so here's the thing. Okay, so by the way, we're going to move this thing over here just like always, and then it becomes that object. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so because the variable starts, so technically it's going to start at 1, and then it's going to compare, and then it's going to move during this, pe this period uh, that uh, A is lower than 10. And basically what it's going to do over here is that it's going to trigger this event about 10 times. So essentially what we're doing is that we're moving the object 20 pixels to the side. That's exactly what we're doing, right? However, there's a little problem. If you try, if you want to use an object like this, a variable like this, it's not going to work because there is a problem with it. So I'm going to fix that for you. Essentially, we're going to go over here. No, I'm not in behaviors. Let me delete this. And we're going to change our variables a little bit. It's going to be counter. This is going to be float x. And this is going to be flow y. Here's the thing. In Clicktain Fusion, when you just type a regular variable, it's never a float variable. And a float variable, as I said before, is zero point whatever the fuck. Right? I just typed that wrong, but whatever. Uh, so we're going to set our position of our object to those floats. Instead of just setting a regular position. So here's what, we, what we're going to do. And start of the frame. Let's move this up. By the way, as I said before, green, green events start before every event so you know start of the frame comes before every single other event in this list i think it says in the manual too that green events are like this and somehow that was one of the things that were helpful so we're gonna go over here and we're gonna set uh, alterable value set flow x to its own position and you can just click on any object just to make it faster here's how i do it for the most part set float y 
Oops. Set it to by. So we're setting those variables initially to this, this number. Right, and instead of setting the position over here, we're gonna change float x and float y. So over here, what we can do, and we should do, is set position, I'm clicking on any object, by the way, set x coordinate to values, and I'm gonna be author above value b, because I know in this object, b is actually float x. So I can just set this and this, it automatically changes to float x. This is just my way of making things faster for me, again. And we can just, well, we can do this. So we're gonna have to go position y. So you can copy this, put it over there, and change the variable name over here, float y. Bam. Fast, just like that. There's several ways of speeding up a lot of things in Sonic Worlds. So basically, at the start of the frame, we're setting float y and float x to those things, to, to the position itself. And now we're setting x position to float x and float y. I hope to god this works. Because if it doesn't work, then I'm going to be very disappointed. But there is a chance it may not, because positions in known follow the frame objects can be tricky for some reason. So, right, okay, so now, instead of making it set x to x, we're going to set variables, set, uh, or I can just add, but we're going to set b to variables b minus 10. So it's I'm gonna set that variable to that variable minus 10. I fucking hope to god it works because none follow the frame objects are just fucking weird. So we start and if it's fucking gone. Of course it's gone. So let's okay, let me deactivate this event and this event and let's see if the object stays there. It stays there. This sucks. So you know I taught you about the float thing. Let's scrap it again. Hmm. X left frame. I never actually used that, so. Anyways, I'm scrapping this. I mean, I'm deactivating it. I'm just keep putting it like this. And it's a position. Position. If you do it through position, I'm sure it went. I'm sure it's gonna work. There we go, now it does work. So instead, I'm gonna set it to 20. Right, might be a little too little, so we can set it to 23 or something like that. Okay, so then... <coughs> we can go over here. If it's greater than 10, don't forget to not overlap those by not making it greater than equal. Uh, minus 1. And if it's lower, yeah, I know, I know, right? Like that thing would work. Um, yeah, as the guy said in the comment, the, all the teachers having trouble. Yeah, surprisingly enough, this is how I would do it anywhere else. But I just haven't done a title card in ages. It's just not a thing I, ha I had to deal with for a while. But if I had to do this somewhere else, it would just been like this, or just via an animation, just like in Unity. Uh, so counter is lower than about 50 or 60 so the tire card is in the screen for like a second maybe a little bit too short so let's make it 90 set it to minus one move it by minus one basically and if it's greater than 90 we move it again by 24 or something like 23 and after that we do it like a 160 or something and you can just destroy the damn object and then as far as I can tell in Quick Team Fusion if you have those events uh, if like if you have an event that is set to an object but that object doesn't exist that they don't trigger as far as I can tell this might not be the case let me just save then ban there is a dumbass tile card <coughs> so how about that other one? I think I'm starting to go fever, guys. How about that other one? Well, if, if we had the, the easy in, easy out object, it would be a lot easier to just do it like that. But let's do it too. So we have everything. 
Okay, so here's the thing. If I order this object to back, it's going to go behind this object. So one thing that you can do is just go over here, order backward by one, which only goes behind that object. Right, so we're going to get this object and you're going to change it into this one. Can also crop it. And make sure you set the hotspot to a good, good spot, like to the corner over there. So it's going to be around here, so, so this should work. It's not an amazing idea though. So what we're going to do over here is that we're going to do a similar thing to this. Uh, we can just use the same event, in fact. Position Y coordinate, in this case we're going to use the, be using the Y coordinate and we can just do this. Uh, and it's when it's going down, it's it's positive. So the further down you are in the stage, uh, the higher your Y value. And we're gonna set it to plus 23. Set it to 10 instead because you know the screen is like half the size vertically. So we're gonna do that, and then over here, minus 10. So oh, oh it didn't even show up. Is this, is this shit this right? As far as I can tell, this is how it works. Yeah. Did I have follow the frame? I might have made a mistake somewhere. Oh yeah, of course. I forgot to do this. And it's set to X as well. No, it's set to Y. I'm getting careless. And I get careless very often. This happens every day. Uh, <laughs> there we go, it doesn't actually show up, it only shows up a little bit, so I might as well increase the speed to 20. It didn't work. Uh, the object is larger, so I guess that's why it, it didn't do that. Right. It did a thing. You can tweak it later, make it better on your own. This is just an example of a tile card. I know a lot of people want to have tile cards, but they are super easy to add. I know I had pro problems over here, that's because I was trying to do it, do it in a different way. So, yeah. Whew. Tweaking, guys. Gotta tweak. Don't be tweaker. Don't be like that guy. That guy is a paid doll. Anyways, I can change this. Instead of 90, I make it like 70. That's good enough, right? Good. We got ourselves our shitty ass fucking tile card. It's bad. It bad. Now it can resume level design fucking finally. How long have we been here? An hour. Oh. Okay. So now we have ourselves a little stage over here. And you can just keep, add keep adding to it. But first of all, before I do that, let's grab some enemies. And I usually like to leave my enemies outside of the screen so we can always find them and they're right over here. We grab some enemies and put them in the stage. And soon I'm going to be teaching you guys how to make a loop as well. So we know how to do it. So, I'm going to be using this guy. Which is from Spark. And mostly uses the same coding actually. So we'll think this one and maybe the Orbanauts. I should be adding in. This dummy. How do I set an Urbanaut? I don't know. I, I didn't code an Urbanaut, so I don't know how they work. Do you just use the dummy? No, I just put it that way. Alright, so we're going to be using the Mega Knot. Specifically. And this guy. And maybe the Motobug. Right, you really have several enemies in worlds that you can use, but... We can, we can make our own enemies, but I do already have an enemy tutorial in my Sonic World site. And I really don't have the patience to make a new enemy anymore. Uh, I already tell you all the basics of, of stuff. But maybe I should actually make a new enemy. Especially in this style. Man, this is gonna be like a fucking train wreck. Okay, I can actually do a little overview of how this enemy works specifically. The police bot. Or the police spawner. It has a spawner, in fact. It's different from most enemies. So, let's just go in it. Let's have a little overview of how it works. 
because it is a thing. Oh, it went through the floor. It went through the floor again because the layer is wrong. There. Can I make a new anime? I want to make a new anime. I didn't press that gate. Get out. Alright, so there we go. It died. <laughs> That's what you get for not placing rings. Alright, so we kill it. There's a little glitch over there. That doesn't look right. Anyway, so... The way this enemy works is that it follows you. It also has some sort of AI that when it hits the wall, it jumps. Uh, oh, look at that. Look at that pink line. Sweet pink line. But here's a... Here's the thing about this enemy, and I'm gonna show it right now. So, this is the destruction object. This is... The thing that falls apart when you hit it, and most of its thing is actually in behaviors. So we have, in always, there's like, it, it kind of works in a way like a destructible object. It has float Y and float X, and then float Y and float X move by X, Y, X speed and Y speed. There's also spin speed, and there's also gravity. So it's, and there's a counter which destroys it after a while. Right, okay, so let's click on police spot, and let's see it. So, okay, so we got the normal animation. Got walking, and then it got running where it puts, it, or it's it's firing basically. But if you go down, you got this, and this, and this, and this. What? Okay, I'm gonna explain all of it. So over here. Oh, oh yeah, this is the thing. Delete this image, please. Click play to test where your colliders actually are, then copy them back in their place. Delete this image, please. Okay. Here's the funny thing, this object, okay, so you want to have objects and you want to put sensors in objects. Well, you can't really do that. Here's the thing about clicking fusion, there's, in Unity, you got this thing called the child of a parent. And a child object is essentially an object within an object, and you can just put them in there and they're there forever. Essentially, if you've got an enemy and you've got a gun that just kind of stays there, that's a child of the, of the, the, uh, the parent, which is the character. That's a child object, and it will follow the player, it will rotate alongside the player, it will do all of those things. Click the infusion on the head. Ain't got that. It's bad. It's horrible. Right? However, to make sensors in Sonic World, Sonic World has sensors around Sonic and they detect collision uh, in a similar way. They are just on Sonic himse uh, on himself. They are separate objects. They are attached to Sonic or something like that. Right. However, f this enemy uses a ha very hackish method I saw in a tutorial. Uh, it's called Embedded Collisions, and it's a tutorial made by one of the guys who I think, I think works for Click Team. I'm not really sure, but he knows a lot about Click Team Fusion. And essentially, if you click on play, let's delete this image. If you click on play, it's hard to see, but if you can't actually see it, we see our police bot shining, and then we see also all the colliders and where they are. Might be a little bit harder to see because this animation is actually going really, really fast. So, yeah, essentially the yellow one is the top one, just like in Sonic World's green bottom, and blah, blah 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 blah. And you can make them spheres or anything. I I just make them this, and the way you reposition them is by moving the hotspot. That's all you do, and you gotta tweak them right, and you're gonna get it to work. But here's how it works in code. Let's go into the, the, the code of the police object, police the bot. So over here we can go into bosses or enemies. Several op, several uh, bosses in Spark are made using this way, by the way. So we're going police bot. And then in police bot, you got several things. There's physics setup, set physics and collisions, and then there's interactions and there's the AI and end actions. There's just like several things. And by the way, you see this on, on each one of police bot loop. That's a thing as well. So here at the start, we start a loop for each police bot, and we also start a loop for each police bot spawner. So we we know that. Um, okay, so this loop is an interesting thing. So remember, remember fast loops and how they loop in between frames. This is kind of similar. However, it loops based on objects. Okay, so this is a little. Thing on Click Fusion, it's hard to wrap your head around. So essentially, let's say you have several rings in the stage, right? 
and you make an event that that says if Sonic collides with the ring, collect the ring. And if when you hit that ring, well, the ring disappears, right? However, if you just make something like, uh, for example, uh, always, always, and then there's the ring object, and you do a destroy, it'll destroy all of them. Why? I'm not really sure. What I think happens over here, or for example, if you if you set the, the, the ring position to something else, pulse, pulse X, if you set it to something else, it, all of the rings will be set to that position. What I think is happening over here is that in several Quick Team Fusion events, it runs automatically this loop, but it doesn't do it for everything. And in fact, by doing this this loop, you can grab a little bit more control. Essentially, when you uh, do an event to an object, OBJ, and you have 50 of those in the scene, it runs in between frames. So here you have frame one and frame two. In between those frames, it does a loop for all those 50 objects and changes this thing for all those 50 objects and then it moves on to frame two. You know, it does all several other things that it had to do as well, but when you do like one little event that might seem like it's just one of those things, it's, it is in fact a whole bunch of loops. So, yeah. Uh, what I think is happening when you do a thing for example, you check collision with one ring, like you have like several. Ugh, God, I just leaked all this. Too. So, for example, when you collide with r one ring, and it only collects that ring, destroys that ring. What I think is happening is that the, the click team is running a loop through the whole rings, all of them, and checking if it's colliding with Sonic or not, and then it destroys the ring that is colliding with Sonic. So essentially, if you tell Click Team Fusion to check collisions with rings, as far as I know, it checks with all of them. That's a little problem, but, you know, the, uh, one thing that I think mitigates this is that the uh, deactivate if too far from the frame. Uh, keep that thing active for objects like rings. Then the, the ring itself would be completely inactive if outside of the, of the, of the, the player. And I hope that it doesn't detect collision, it doesn't check. He only checks with the ones that are in the frame. Hope you got that. So, yeah. However, this thing, let me make one for you. So I'll go over here and we can go into the, anyhow, so let's go into uh, Mechasonic and go into count and for each object. And now we run a fast loop of Mecha. It's the same thing. So now we run Mecha for all Mechasonics that exists. So essentially now, if we use this event, for example, let me copy this. If we use this event, and we of course name it the same way, right? If you use this event, it's the same thing as an always, except it will only affect the police bot. It only affect that thing. And one thing that we can do for it is, we can do several things. For example, here I'm using an always to set the, its physics parameters and there's several things, you know, I, I tell you guys about the float X and float Y and this is exactly what we're doing. Sonic himself uses this, this is how he, he, he works. You know, at the start of the frame, in this case I'm using only one action and event loops because uh, I want like when the thing just shows up, it sets the thing, should it? Wait, does it? Oh, Ugh, I don't know what this is. I don't know what this is here. I don't think it does anything. Whatever, because the position is set when the object is created. So essentially, I run uh, the same kind of loop, loop for the, the spawner, and then I ha have this loop running over here. And then once I have this loop running over here, I have a condition over here. And this condition uh, checks, this is this is a function, it's called O distance, and it means object distance. And inside of those brackets, you put uh, an object and X and Y. And the way I think you do this is by, if I delete this, I go into the object itself, which is a one is one of the police, police bot spawner. I click on it and there's position 
and I think you can find distance, distance to a point. And I click in here and here it says X and Y and I just put the X coordinate here and the Y coordinate here. Make sure to leave this, it, it's a comma, is it a comma? Coma, get into a coma. Uh, you, you, you put this thing in the middle of it and don't forget this thing as well, just leave them over there and just change this thing. It, it also get rid of the, the arrows and put a distance or not. And then you got this thing, for example, this is the player object. This is the little green sphere that's inside of, of, of Sonic. So we use that thing. And yeah, it sets a lot of things as well. But here's the fun part. In set the physics and collision, here's how the collision works. And I already like have some several texts over here telling you a little bit about how it works. Okay, so it has several variables that tell if it's collided or not, and we use those to detect collision, but Essentially, here's what you do. There's an always over here and it sets the collision to left collider. And here's the left sensor. And then we just check collision by using that sensor. We just check collision. Essentially, what we're doing over here is that we're changing the character animation to, and by the way, there is a thing that saves the animation, the last animation image that we have. So we don't really lose the animation and it keeps the, in, in the same way as before, essentially. Uh, and we set this to something, for example, overlapping a backdrop, because when you when you change an object, it's, when you change the animation, it also changes the sh shape of the object. And because it, it clicked in Fusion uses pixel perfect collision, now we are changing the whole thing into the sensor, and then now we check collision. And then when we check collision, we create a loop, start a loop, several times, in fact, in fact 35 times, and here's what it does, which is interesting, is that it pushes pushes the object back as long as this loop is playing. And then it pushes the object away from the wall. See here, over here, flow X, like flow X plus one, it just pushes it away. And after it's done pushing, uh, it checks. It doesn't, though, it checks every, every time the loop is running if it has stopped overlapping a backdrop. And this is the negate function. If you go over here, in any event, we can choose negate. And essentially it compares to the opposite of it. So if it's not overlapping this object, do this thing. In this case, we don't want it to be negated, but in this thing, we check if it's overlapping a backdrop, but we don't, it's an X, it's a negative. So we check if it's not overlapping a backdrop. And then we stop the loop, it says stop loop. And then it stop this loop. And you do the same for all of them. Same thing, especially the down sensor. So the down sensor itself has a little bit more of a complicated code because it's also related to it has friction related to it and some other things, I think. But for the right sensor, it's essentially the same thing. And then you can see over here, always right collider, always bottom collider. And it's, you know, have the green over here. This is the green area. And this is technically supposed to be the, the red area. Oh yeah, though, this is the blue area because it has the blue right up there for some reason. Technically, it should be over here, but. And then right over here, you got the red area and then you have the green area yellow area and the, uh, yeah, the yellow area. There's no, there's no blue area. I actually had a blue sensor before, but this didn't really work. So I didn't yet do it. I didn't really use it. So basically here and now we set the object back to animation save and frame save, which is the, the, the variables we set before. Essentially over here, we set to, we set frame save to the frame that the objects have. It's called image for some reason, but this is just a variable that says the current frame of animation that we had before. And then we set an animation save to the anim animation number. And it's, you can set those by going to the object itself. Let's see if we can find it. Yeah, and I think it's this one. Yeah. You go into animation and there's current, current animation value, current frame, current direction value. Set it to animation value. And there anim, uh, anim number police uh, fragment. In this case, I selected the wrong object. This is the fragment, this is the actual police spot. Check the name, sometimes the, the images can be very similar. Uh, so you can do mistakes by actually setting things to objects that are just look incredibly similar, but are completely different objects. So you might fuck yourself up that way. Top sensor also as well. And now we have interactions. And this is exactly the same as every other enemy almost. It's, it's the, here the, in this group we set things like if it's overlapping the, fl the flame, we set hurt to one. And if 
uh, and if we are overlapping this object and hurt is equal to zero and attacking is equal to zero, so we're not spinning, we set hurt to one, which means the Sonic's gonna get hurt. Remember, zero means not hurt, one means Sonic gets hurt. If you set it to, if you compare it to it, it's just comparing if the state of the hurt. One means Sonic just got hurt and is hurting. <laughs> and two means Sonic is fucking dead. So... Yeah, basically. And here we have destroy enemy, so essentially if we... Uh, attacking is equal to one, and the box, player's box, hits it. It subs one from its HP, and it has uh, an HP thing over here. So here's what you do. I had a destroy event for some reason. I don't know why this is here, I can just delete it. Uh, anyway, so it has, of course, it has the on, it, for, in, the for each loop on top of it. Uh, this is somewhat necessary. You might want to have this just because it, this thing helps you prevent glitches. So sometimes if you have multiple objects that are being acted upon, it's good to have one of those. Um, so it checks if HP is equal to zero and it creates an explosion set state to one and ignore this thing, but I don't know exactly what means the setting the state of the explosion to one. It's probably something in worlds that I don't know about, but it just set, sets it to one. But there's another event, and I did this because there's a little weird fact about Click Team Fusion that when you create an object, for example here we created, created an object, it's the police fragment, and then we go and set several variables of that object to something else, Click Team Fusion is only going to change this object. So if we had created this explosion and created this for fragment in the same event, there could be a couple of glitches where either our objects didn't spawn or it would just spawn one of them or it would just spawn in the wrong place or whatever. So I separated them to two different events. It checks if HP is equal to zero, it creates the thing and then it checks again and then it does this and then it finally destroys police bot. It this is the the fragment, this is the, the the spinning police bot that just goes flying when you hit it. It's a different object, right? But now we have the AI, and the AI looks, as far as I can tell, is very similar to uh, to the way it works for the boss. I guess this one doesn't actually use states. Hey, yeah, it's just a simple AI. So basically, it has several conditions. Never forget to have this thing. Instead of using always, I just use this thing. Right, and it sets the uh, it sets its targets to the player. It sets a variable called target to the player, and over here it also has an event that if it's too far away from the player, and here it, it checks the di it checks abs from oh what why did it do this exactly? This is one way of detecting uh, distance, as far as I know. This is only distance in X though. It doesn't detect distance in all uh, in X and Y, which is what the uh, the distance does distance actually detects why in this case this event might be a bit of a bullshit event whoops so <laughs> over here now I set the direction of it if the direct if you know the position flow X is, is smaller than uh, or lower than the target then it looks into that direction because the target is now ahead of it and same for over here because the target be behind it and now we have several other events where we just add speed to it. For example, here add 0.16 to speed. In this case, the speed is just being set depending on how close it is to the object and whatnot. And it creates the flame and several other things. And this the flame is also created based on the speed. And it also does another group over there. It's called walls interaction. And basically just checking. If it's colliding, if it's colliding, then it just moves it upwards. In this case, it detects if, if it's colliding and it's on the ground. So Botco, right co and Botco, and it makes the character jump. And here, I think we just have the have uh, the flame itself, which is set to X uh, plus its its one position plus the B variable, which is uh, I believe it's just its uh, X speed variable variable. It's just called how to the B. And then in inaction is this has several other things as well. In fact, you need to set all of your call variables to zero at the end. The end of all the events of the police board. So that happens. This is how it works essentially. And if you want to make an enemy like it, I recommend you uh I recommend you just uh, and by the way several enemies have certain qualifiers to them. Make sure they're all the same. Like this 
I believe targets is for uh, uh, things that can be ho homed on. Not really entirely sure, but just make sure you mark them as enemy and nine for some reason. I don't know why exactly. It's probably something internal to worlds, but just keep it like that. And now that we're done with that, we can go ahead and, ma and make the work on the stage a little bit more. So we're gonna be working on it for a little while. We can add some more police bots. So here, for example, we're gonna introduce the player to the police bot. So how we do that? Remember that we had a spring over here, and the player is gonna touch the spring, and it's gonna hit over here, and then he's gonna slow down. So once it slows down, we can add a place where the police bot's gonna interact with the player. We can add another cliff over there, so the player has to jump over it. Add this, so we can keep doing this, and then we can put a play spot in an open area the player can see and interact with. This isn't technically safe, the play spot is aggressive, but the play spot takes a while to activate its flame, so the player might actually have a window to escape from it. We could, you could just, you know, do something like this. This is like more, the, more of a Mega Man thing, and just have the play spot just kind of stay in there <laughs> it just stays in there like just kind of looking for the player and throwing its flame but doesn't really do much so one thing that we can do is add a little bit of a secret down here because the play spot's gonna come over here as this is the creativity with level design you need to think about those things and do those kinds of stuff we can increase this thing a little bit and then we can add some secret down here some sort the player is probably gonna want to grab so yeah and the thing is the flame is gonna be throwing from the police spot so the player is gonna have to time his descent it's not a big challenge by any means but it's nonetheless a challenge and it is appreciated you need to add challenges alongside your level design in fact you need to the the good le good kind of level design doesn't really make you think you're in a level design you just play it and you don't even like realize it it's it's like all made up and, like some people criticize level design but they are probably still immersed in it in a way there are ways level design can completely break immersion that is a fact but probably not in this case since our classic sonic's also a little bit faster i think we have the leeway of adding something like a slope right over here so we also add this object to the end of it and there we go so we might not be able his thing though we might not be able to see the police spot from where we are so we might, might as well move those platforms up and just keep the police spot down there now we gotta test it and see if it works let's go there Now we see it, it's doing this thing, and if it, the flame's going, we can get hit by it, so we might as well wait, and then go grab our stuff, and we might as well put a spring over here or something like that. So there's also a little risk that the player might, might hit the spring, so it might do something like this, just move that platform back a little bit, in a way that we don't really see it, and order the things right, so things work, and make sure you move things and if you're following that pattern right you can essentially move your things inside of each other without much problem things are still gonna look like they they snatch together in a way so now i can grab a spring a spring over here just put it over there might not be enough to put us over there though so who knows we'll see i need to test it we can get, actually get stuck in there, so let's see if we can get stuck in there. Or else we might have to add another type of spring. Let's see. Oh! <laughs> yep, if we don't time it, we fucking die. But, I mean, there's no ring, so... We can hear the flame in that situation, so there really isn't much excuse for me getting hit. 
You also knew that the enemy was there, so... Yeah, I think you get stuck. Unless you can just use the double jump, but... So, since we get stuck, we should put this over here. Get this object. Put it over here. Yes, it's all, it's very useful to always have one of those little blocks. So you know what you're doing. Might as well do something like this. And over here, you can just put in a monitor. In this case, all monitors are up here. Make sure you copy and paste them and don't actually move them. In this case, let me put on a, some, some rings, some rings. Uh, does it get annoying? Yeah, a little bit. In fact, let me just, instead of making it this, let's put it in the start of frame. And there we go. They're always playing with that one. And by the way, this icon over here, it's supersonic, but we can change it later. Uh, there's a portion, there's a part in the game where you can change it. In fact, we also had this thing over here, so it's kind of feels like more like a hidden room of sorts. And we can also place some monitors over there as well. I always usually place rings later and not at the start. You can place rings whenever you want, but I'm not gonna do that for now. I'm just gonna be doing some level design. And right, so here in this case, the player has been through some platforming if they went in the upper path. So maybe they're gonna want something like some kind of speed section over here. But considering the way the level design is, it might be a little hard to add some kind of speed section. But we can try. Just need to get a little bit... Uh, we need to improvise a little bit. So we can do this. Put this thing over here. Maybe this one. Move it to back. So by doing so, my idea is that the player is going to go over here and then BAM! That's the, the idea anyways, that might not work or may, may just work just fine. We'll see, that. give the player a little bit of, of a lead room to, to, start, to start his run cycle. So... Also put those things, make sure it looks fancy enough. Or you can just do something like this. Oh yeah, let me see about that. It's a little bit of a cop out since it doesn't use physics all that much. But then again, the player has to come over here and then land in the right spot so he can go fast. Uh, but now, as you can see, we introduced the poli police bot down here. And we're gonna have to do something similar for this route. But how are we gonna do it? Well, there are several ways of doing it, but we're gonna see. Mm -hmm. Right. So since this thing, I need to put some room for this area over here, I might as well move this thing a little bit over there. Okay, now this thing, just to make it a little bit more fancy, I'm gonna move this here, Put this here. Right, so I have a little bit of a speed section over here so the player can enjoy it. There was already a shit ton of platforming. Not a shit ton, just a tiny little bit of platforming. Might as well do something. In this case, since the player is gonna go over here, so he, if he tries to spin Nash, might as well add some like rings over here, so... If he really decides to... This is the debug cursor, damn. That in the ring. Always check the names, by the way. This is the, this is the moving ring, and it's not gonna show up, so just grab the regular ring. And now we can put some. One thing that I like to do is like I like to put rings like over this, so the player is like inclined to fall in this right spot. We can put some rings over here too. And by the way, if you have the pattern again, it's a lot easier to place rings as well. Don't forget that some people, when they play a game, they go for every single collectible possible. So in a way, uh, you you would want to have those collectibles off screen a little bit. So that so if a player doesn't see it, they're not gonna want to go for it. 
but if they just c grab them by surprise, well, then it's, it feels good, like it's, it's a little surprise, and they're gonna be like, oh yeah, I got some rings. I'm gonna put them a little bit forward as well, so they fall in the right spot. Also change this thing, so when they hit, hit this thing, they're gonna stop, and then they're gonna fall this direction. I hope. In fact, you can just move it a little bit. You gotta think about those things when making a level. Man, it took me how, how long to get to level designing? Like, an hour? Damn. Make sure to always fill those areas as well. So, and now, add some detail. can make this thing continue from over there. So a lot of people praise the, the waterfalls in, uh, in Green Hill Act 2 for Mania. They're like, oh my god, they they connect! And it's like, that's not very hard. You can literally just make the stage and then make them connect afterwards. As far as I can tell, anyway. It's not the hardest thing in the world. This, this is an example of it. There we go, there's like, like a little speed section. Player should be going fast at this rush section, so I think I can make them go a little bit higher than normal. So let's keep level design here. Right, so now the player is in the upper path, you have to be introduced to the police bot. Either we can do the same exact thing, or we can think of something else. In this case, I want to copy this, place it over here or something, somewhere. Uh, like over here. And... right. Hmm. Moving platforms with fire robots, hmm. No, I have a better idea. I think it's better. So the player could either go fast enough to be able to go to the top, or the player could go slow enough to be able to go to the bottom, and so they would be forced to see the police bot right over there. And now over here, we can have a little platforming where they will be forced to be put into danger and have to deal with the police bot in order to reach the upper platform by themselves. So we can just do this. And one thing to maintain flow as well is that we can put an invisible spring over there. I believe Angel Island did something similar. So over here, we'll go on layer 8 and just put a platform on top of it. So basically when the player reaches it, there's going to be a spring. The only problem is that the player might be able to skip the police spot, but then again, it's not really that big of a deal. Just put it a little bit above there. Yeah, I think they might just end up hitting the spring. So I'm deleting the first spring, there's only that one over there, as you can see it. So... And by the way, at least the uh, works, I work on routes interchangeably and then I go working on the level as I go. Like I'm gonna finish this, this challenge and then move on to the lower route, you know. So after the player goes over here, I can make the block the player, putting some blocks at the top. Right, so from over here we can make the player exit by having to go over here. There's like a spring. Well, not a spring, you can use one of those moving platforms in fact. Over here, and then the player has to go to the moving platform and then moving, uh, moving up here, or somewhere of a sort put a spring in here and the player has to go over here and go over there. Just gonna make ground this thing. I hope they're finally touching it. I need to make one of the grounds this object in the beginning so the player doesn't feel like they can't touch this object. They will essentially be forced to. 
so they will not see this as like, oh, this is like an electric wall. No, it's it's just there. This will make sure that that happens. Level designing is with Clifton Fusion is fairly easy. It's always been. I don't know how it is a game maker, but to me, making levels has always been a good good thing. Yeah, but a good thing, more of like uh, somewhat of a relaxing and more a little bit more. I don't know how to explain it. It's just kind of it's not easy. It's not easy, but. It's more relaxing, I would say, than programming, where you have to be like, Holy shit, where is this thing? Why is it not working? Now you just put a level together, you see if it works, and then test it out, and if it doesn't work, then you do something else, and think about it for a little while. Uh, ideas for level design for me usually come pretty fast, but then again, I don't have that many of them. A lot of people think my levels are pretty bland, which is a valid criticism. I try to ad address them a lot in Spark by adding a lot more... Uh, the name of those things I don't know fluffiness just flashiness to them like little events where you go to a certain part of the stage and now an object starts to chasing you for example like a, a set pieces basically and there we go we can add detail over there now that this is done and hasn't been test tested which I will test later hmm Oh, uh, you can't duplicate objects in the room editor. Holy shit. That seems bad. I just control C, control V, literally everything. That's how everything works. Holy shit. It must be awful. Anyway, so over here, uh, there was a little introduction to the police bot. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna finally like make the player face the police bot in some ways, but first I'm gonna do a little platforming challenge, make the player face the police bot, and after that I'm just gonna go for a speed section. And as you can probably tell, check it out, check the level map, level's going up! It's going upwards, so we're gonna make sure that if the player falls back again later on. And we can mess around with the routes, in fact we can add a third one during the speed section which you can jump to. So over here we shouldn't do a straight, we should do uh, straight level design like that, like lines like that just aren't very great. It's quite boring actually for the player and for for me. So just do something like this. And then you had a platform and I know in this case the player can literally just double jump over there but yeah, actually, since you can do that, you probably need to raise this thing. And there's a little problem, it hits that path, so we might as well change things a little bit. So we can fix it. So let's, let's hide that thing over there, just so it doesn't look too boring. I think this is good enough. There we go. I hope this teaches people something about level design. Seriously, do. And in this case, since our classic Sonic EX can jump, one well, double jump, we need to put some rings in here, so we can sort of like tell the player that there's something in here, and that he needs to di divert his eyes to this direction. And if he does so, he will, re will realize that he has to go over here. And in fact, we can just put something over here as well for those that are a little bit more explorative and want to just. Go grab some stuff. So we got some more rings over here too. Yeah, I hope people learn about level design. Like, I'm okay. So there's this channel on YouTube called Game Maker's Toolkit. I don't watch it a lot, but <laughs> from what I've seen from it, it feels like oh, look at the name of the thing's Game Maker Toolkit. It's gonna teach me stuff about games I've never seen. And then I go and watch it. It's like every other gaming channel I've ever seen that talks about game design. Like Amato Matosa's video would teach me a lot more than that. But for the most part, most things to me about game design I learn by myself by doing it. And I guess just by seeing my process and how I do things, you guys should be able to 
have a better grasp on things and see my thought process, like what I think when I'm doing certain things. Make sure to always save, never forget to do that. And in fact, I'm gonna make a backup save. So I'm gonna go over here and call this not so simple worlds plus two. And there we go. Now we have a different file that has the same name, but it's, it's, it's a different file. All right, so over here, introduce the police bot and we might we have a platforming section and we might want to have a challenge against the police bot over here, like just having a section where you actually have to face it, right? Now we finish this section and we're going to do that just up there. Going to be putting this platform over here, adding a little bit of a block to it since, you know, we need the player to stop or at least consider or at least jump because when the player jumps, the player is invincible because it's Sonic. So in a way, if you make the player jump, that's a safe option. So it's good to make the player jump before you do anything. Also, another thing you have to keep in mind is that sometimes you might, might be able to trigger the police bot even though you're down here because you're just going to get into the camera's way. So make sure you put, put him somewhere that that's not going to happen. For example, I'm going to add some more things over here. Let's make this place a little bit higher then. Because that might be a problem that we need to consider. So, put this thing over here. Make sure to mix a, mix and match your tile sets a lot too. Just so your level doesn't get boring and kind of looks somewhat different from beginning to end. Like we're gonna we get this object over here, put it in the middle for like no reason. And make sure it fits too, you know. I'm like God. No, stop it. Right, so we're doing this, but though we can't really reach over here, I'm not, never going to be able to, it's fine. So... Uh, and now we can place this over here. There we go. Fast level designing. Now I have a little area where the player has to come face to face with the play spot. It's just a little challenge, you have to introduce the player. And after that, I should probably start like a speed section after that point. Might as well raise those, those things over here since the player can double jump, we need to keep that in mind. Might as well move this thing right over here too. Put the chat to appear next to the stream for the next stream. Sh should I do that? But where should I put the chat though? I'm not, I'm not sure where I should put the chat because I know a lot of people can't see it. They might be like, oh, wh what are, who are you replying to? Okay, Voltrix, is this trolling? Stop it. Just makes you look dumb, dude. Right, so to get started and a lot of cases in a lot of cases a lot of people want to just put a dash pad in here just make sonic go we don't really have to do that uh but we need to make loops how are we gonna do that well we already have certain objects over here that we can use so from those two objects we're gonna make all the loops in the level so from this one this is the red one and we're gonna make this set of objects for the red one and probably for those as well so here's the thing we're gonna go over here here, select this one and then delete this. Copy and paste it, flip it. God damn it. Order doesn't really matter. Get the red paint. There we go. We need to make sure that we know what is our red object. And there's a green. By the way, all of this thing's in the right place. Nice. So here's what you can do you can just clone this fucking thing. Go over here. Be aware though that you can actually add animations past this point if you loop it to it. So, right, we ain't gonna do that. Oh, and don't just flip the objects a lot of the times. It's best to just do this. Right click, flip, flip horizontally. Right click. Flip vertically. Same for here. Let me just use that. 
And it's good that we gr grab all of them so we have all of them to use. Oh, probably shouldn't have done, done that. I guess it's fine. So now we're gonna ma be making those. What the fuck? Oh, I'm clicking the wrong thing. I'm not following my own teachings. So, let's just do this for now. And now we need to be mindful of the sensors. Uh, we can find those sensors over here, and there's several of them. But really, all we need are the red and blue ones, which... God, where are them? It's the 000 and the 111. Anything like that. In Spark, for the most part, I just use... There we go. They, they are so weird. We just need those two. That's all we need. In Spark, for example, we use all those. Some people use more than those, but I will just use those. So now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab all those copy and paste them over there. So, what we can start doing is by... Mm, what exactly should I do? Let's make the player go down. But just, let's just do down a very lazy way of sorts and copy all those things. It's gonna be kinda lazy, because we're just gonna be using this. So, here's the thing though, sometimes the player might jump out of it. So we gotta make sure that they don't do that. We can add either a platform over here or a ceiling that prevents them from jumping out of it. Because, you know, you wanna make your speed section and you don't want players to fuck up the speed section and lose all the fun. So, we do this. Into those. Not the best kind of speed section, really, but should do it. Then you have this, and then we can have a little bridge. E. You know, if you put a dashpad you were in them, there is places where dashpads are acceptable. Here's the thing though, in Classic Sonic, dashpads are literally everywhere. But not literally everywhere. <laughs> okay, so launch base zone. That place is filled with dash pads. However, nobody complains about it. And the reason why is because it's only one of several stages in Sonic 3. Dash pads are a, f a gimmick for a stage. And for example, in Sonic 2, you only really had dash pads in Chemical Plant. And that was one stage that was, sp that was supposed to feel like a roller coaster, for example. So dash pads need to be placed sparingly. They need to be different make them into a different thing in launch base that the dash pads are completely different from the dash pads in in uh in just regular sonic in in uh, sonic 2 and in sonic cd they were all different they all looked different you know okay so let's place the loops let's make them so let me grab those things and move them off a little bit so here we're gonna, we're gonna get the red and put the red in here Get the blue, put it in here, and the top, regulars. That's how I do it usually. And one thing that we can do is that we can also make this into the top of it. So make a little top for, for a little loop. Is this right? No. Okay, so we need to line, line it up well enough. And here's the thing though. There's no ground really here, so we need to place some so we know there's something in there. Make sure to follow the pattern. Get things right. Don't fuck it up. And... and... Now we have kind of a loop in the middle of nowhere. Now we can, you know, also move those things down there. Now, here's how the sensors are gonna work. First of all, we need to make sure that we are on the red layer. And the red layer, which is zero, uh, just means that uh, blue things are not collidable, but red things are. That's all that there is to it. 
And there's another problem is that if we want to... Hmm, here's what we should, we should do. We should place a layer 8 object on top of the red one. So we go, t go through this, like walking on this thing over here. And then we do the loop and then we walk out of it. And in fact, you need to go over this and order it to back. Just so you make sure it's not in front of Sonic. We could do the same thing with that one. Just order it for up, but I'm gonna use a regular object on top of it. For now, I'm gonna leave it out. But essentially, you need the red sensors to be kind of surrounding it in a way. Because this is the thing, sometimes you could be moving really fast, and if you put it right over here, the player can collide with the sensor. But then the green sensor, which is on its side, could collide with the blue, and then Sonic could come to a halt. And then he would start walking again because you're just holding forward. So make sure it's a little bit away from the loop so that doesn't happen. You know, so that it doesn't collide with the blue one. There's a little bit of a leeway over there. Same thing for over here. And at the top, we add a red over here and a blue over here. So basically, here's what happens. So it goes over here, becomes, uh, becomes red, and then it goes over here, becomes red again but it goes over here and then becomes blue and then touches the blue and then gets out of it and it becomes blue again for some reason, but whatever. Because, you know, we need to do the reverse as well. There we go. It's a simple way of doing loops using only two of the sensors over there. So don't get yourself too confused. I can also put them inside over here a little bit more. This does make j loop jumping a little bit harder, so we can, in fact, put the sensor over here if we need to. The player jumps and then hits it. Or something like that jumps from the top and hits that over there. You can you can fiddle with it. So you make that thing possible. You can do something like this, for example. Really depends. Some people just put like the whole thing in the middle. There are several ways you can do it really. For speedrunners, they're gonna want this thing to be consistent, so you gotta keep that in mind. Uh, but since you're making just a little fan game, you might not even think about that, about it that all that much. Uh, in Spark, they work mostly like without those two, just those two. Flip jumping is fine, but it's like, you technically do it through over here, I think. And in Spark, it's really not that much of a big deal. You can just like mash dash, and go like super fast. So. There we go, we have a little loop over there. I taught you a little bit of the basics on loops. Now, what are we going to do over here? Well, so since Sonic is going fast, I'm going to delete that. I'm going to uh, have the player go up a little bit more. Or not. Okay, so to keep the speed. Okay, I'm doing shit on layer 8. Damn, look at that. If I disable layer 8, I can see that I'm doing things on it, and sometimes this can screw you up badly. Because you're not going to know where you are and what the fuck you're doing. So, this is bad, but... Did it. Alright, I've been here for almost two hours. I'm going to be here for like two more 30 minutes or so, I believe. So... We can either add... What I want to do over here is that I want a spring to send the player into that direction. Or we can just do something of the of the chemical plant variety of things. Let's see if it works. Mm, it's too high. So maybe if we put another one, we can totally do it. Almost. Well, we can try. So let's do it. Uh, over here, I'm gonna clone the blue. Let's make this thing into one of them. Let's chemical plant this bitch up. So, this is what we can do. Put it over here, or s anywhere really. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna put it over here. And we need to do a little little wall over there. This is exactly have to be in here. More like over here. Uh, 
Right. It's a little bit of a boring kind of wall over here. In this case, we can... Uh, let's, let's get back this thing that was on layer 8. It, I just left it in there and we can just put this thing over here. Okay, so you can get this thing, it's on layer 8, and put it over here, put it in front of it. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna go get spring, red spring. Because we're gonna go fast. Put this red spring over here. Not layer 8, layer 7, which is our player layer. It can be different in everything, for example. I just set it to, I just named it playable. Just make sure you're doing things on the right layer. And then we're gonna go through this thing all the way up there. Things might not be exactly right, for example. There's a little problem over there, so one thing I can do is that I can move those. Just a little bit. There's a little problem there. Things aren't exactly right. But it should work. For the most part. Can add this as well to hide it. Hide my flaws. There we go. I can add this thing over here too. Just to hide a little bit more flaws. Hiding your flaws. The leg peppered. Make sure not to do this. Because if you do this and there's a little angle gap over here, it's like a small little gap, the player can jump on it and he can Sonic World this thing. He can like run on it. So try not to do that. Um, I can do a I can do a half pipe, but if I put a spring on the top, I don't think it's gonna work because the springs aren't set to work like that in Sonic Worlds. Okay, so I'm just gonna do it like this. In fact, I wanna make another loop, and we haven't actually set the sensors up there as well. We need to do that. Let me get this thing and put it on layer 8. This thing as well, put it on layer 8. Oh, things are decent. That's fine. So, right over here, we need things to be set to layer 1 once we actually reach the top. So we can put layer 1 over here and over here as well. We actually can't really go back. To go back, we're, we're, we would need a like just a layer switch uh, thing. But in this case, we don't really need to go back, so I'm not gonna bother too much about it. I can put this thing over here too, just to make it more fancy. Let me get this thing. Put it in here. Not sure if it's gonna work. Uh, platforms like this one sometimes they just don't cooperate. It's it's an unfortunate tragedy of it. But whatever. Now we can have the player go here. Okay. And we're almost done. There was a thing in there. Oh boy, all of that first speed section, huh? We have an interesting one in our hands. And by the way, once we actually test this level, we're gonna realize that... Oh, and by the way, uh, well, sometimes gaps like this happen. So just cover it with something. It, it's, a, it's a shameful thing, they happen a lot. So... Yeah, we're, we're gonna be like... You're gonna be like, working on a speed section really hard for like, hours. And then you test it and it's over in like a second. Be aware of that. That it's gonna happen a lot. And by a lot I mean every time. So Sonic levels are replayable. All that work doesn't go to waste. I spend a lot of time working on something, but it's bound to happen that people are going to spend a lot of time playing as well. That's good. For example, over here, now we have this little gap over here. And the player might Sonic World to this thing, but it's it's really high up, so it's really hard to reach. The player might not even reach it, so it's technically fine to have that in there. Right, let's save. I see how you make hidden walls. 
Mm. Well, technically here it's a region where you can technically go explore and find maybe like some rings. Not really necessary to have something like this over here, but it was interesting. Those kinds of, of uh, parts always like show up in my level design, and I just instead of like closing this area, I always take the opportunity to do something with it. Just make good uses of your opportunities in your levels to add hidden stuff. Just make good use of it. Yeah, something like that. People wanted me to make a special stage, but special stages are too different. They're different in every game. Like, what kind of special stage would I make? You know, and they're they aren't really necessary. There are bonuses. You need to finish your main game first, and then do the bonuses later. Super Sonic is a bonus. You know, don't focus on the bonus. Don't just focus on the things you like. Focus on the main things. But if you just want to focus on the things you like, then why don't you just make the things you like? Make a game, make a Sonic game that is only a special stage. You know. I know people have this ring of making this massive Sonic game, but you gotta lower your ambitions. You have to lower your ambitions. You have to uh, think something like, okay, so can I actually pull this off? And then you say, maybe not, maybe I should remain my scope down for a little bit and work on this main thing. Then once you're done with that, then you can start doing something else. And then sooner or later, you're gonna have uh, a f like a finished game and it's gonna have all those things if you don't overthink too much. Just go with the flow, man. Don't don't daydream. Don't reach for the stars. Don't do that. Reach for the planets and then you reach for the stars. You know, before you can actually go to Mars, you have to know how to go to the moon. So don't. Step by step, you get better. Yeah, in another sense, you can just make game. <laughs> you can reach for the stars, but first you have to reach for the planet. If you can't get to the planets, then how can you expect to get to the stars? That simple. So you reach for the planets, and then you get to the planets, and then you get to the to the stars. Right. So here we go. This kind of uh, of speed section is quite boring, though. I, I just I just don't have that much uh, things I can set up to have a better speed section. So I'm just gonna using be using this so far. So this. So let's take a look at how our level is starting to look like. Check it out. And I haven't even tested it. Uh, I do have this habit of not not testing it my levels a lot, and it's a bad thing because you're gonna there's gonna be flaws that are gonna be carried over later. But the thing is, at this point, I've done so many levels that I actually have faith in it, and I kind of already know how things are gonna go. So I'm not too bothered by it. Sometimes I just do a lot and then I test it later and then I fix it up. Even if I scrap it, it's fine because I learned something in the process. Don't feel bad about scrapping stuff. It's okay. This is all about learning, really. Making fan games is all about getting better at making projects. You can't really sell it anyways. You can't do much with a fan game. So make sure, make sure you do it, do the best in it to learn as much as you can for a possible future career that if, if you want to take in this. If you're, if you're doing it just for the hobby, make sure you just do it. If you just like doing it, then shouldn't be any problem with scrapping stuff. So... No, it doesn't make great DLC. <laughs> Fact is, things that are quote-unquote scrapped but made into DLC were never scrapped to begin with. They were kept on like an on-hold thing. Alright, so here's what we're gonna do. In this section, we can jump from over here, so... 
Let me add a little bit of a section over here that we can jump from. And I can add a loop over there as well, so let's do that. I could add some rewards on top of it, but technically we're just going to land on top of it. So who knows. And here's where our third path starts, starts in. We're going to have a speed section that goes over here, and we're going to have a down path that starts from over here, and a middle path that goes from over here. And in fact, we didn't actually go down that much as in this thing. Could have done that, but we didn't. Oh, whatever. So, so I did this. Oh, just keep with that one. Did I add a loop over there? Halfway, there's like this thing. This to be on layer 8. Uh, look at that, it's DG Boy's team from F Zero GX. Or AX in this case. Technically, it's AX. Thing down. Looks a little bit more pleasing. Or not. Mm, just mindless level design, you know. I feel like I've explained most things. Don't forget, if you can go on top of a loop, maybe add something to it. In this case, I'm gonna be a little bit of a dick and block this area, but not this one. But I want the player to use that one move where you can do a double jump, dash, and then do a double jump to get over here. In fact, I'm gonna make it a little bit harder by making this one step higher. And I'm gonna put in some ring monitors over there. I have a dickish thing to do because when the player gets out of it, it's gonna be like, what the fuck, how do I get there? And they might want to go back, but hey, who knows? As long as it feels good. I really curious. A little hint toward this area by adding some detail over here. Order to back, make sure you always do those things. Don't put foreground objects on top of your object, just put them, like, don't, don't do this. It's not gonna look right because you're gonna collide over here, but you're gonna still be above this object. It's gonna feel really odd and awkward. Don't do that. Did I plan the lessons? Not at all. That's why they're bad. <laughs> So did I have a place where you fight the guy? Yes, but over here we didn't, so we might as well just have a place where we can fight him. So over here, there's no really need to add a loop, I would say. Maybe there is a need. So let's grab this thing. Let's make this into a little loop. You guys ready to blitz ball? Let's get it! That. Add another layer of stuff in here. In this case, the player might lose enough speed in order to be able to do this without much issues. Maybe placing this thing a little bit more over here would be better. You've got to space your things right. Why? Well, pacing. 
That's a layer 8. Fuck. Always making that mistake. That's layer 6 now. The fuck? Oh my god. If you disable the layer like this, you can see the objects that are in it. I, did I put it on layer 6 again? I need, I need to drink some bleach. Hold on, guys. It's my mistake, really, to be honest. It's not really... Quick to Infusion's fault. At least it has a layer system. <laughs> so, for example, over here, you have two objects of the same length because it didn't exactly fit. Why did I do that? Well, most people won't really notice that it's like this. There's like two of them, so it's okay to do that. Right. So, since the player went down over here, the player should be going like super fast. What should I do about this exactly? I'm not really sure. We can have the player go go high and mighty, and then have something like this. No, I was right. It's a Vizzler. By the way, mix, mixing those two things ends up, ended up being very useful. I always have blocks you can mix and match like this. It's really useful. Right, so since the player is going really, really fast, then I'm going to make him lose speed so he can do his thing. I'm going to add a hidden spring over here. Right, so in this case, you probably need to make the player go over here instead after getting out of that thing. I'm doing shit on layer 8 again. Damn. Things are mostly right. One thing that we can do is also use the slopes for detail. Just put that one over there. All right, guys, hold on a second. I need to go we'll take a piss. I'll be right back. In fact, I might be end ending this stream kind of soon, so we'll see. Uh, be right back.
Okay, that didn't take very long. <laughs> Let's go. I'm gonna be ending the stream real soon. I'm gonna have to go, but we can do a couple more things before then. Let's hide a red spring over there, and then we should be ending it. The red spring. I will test the level real soon. Gotta do that. So I can grab this thing. I know some people might be actions for me to actually test the level, but I do chill out. I mean, anyway, I just want to get as much done as possible. Because when I start testing the stage, I test for a long while. Because I need to be finding, like, did I put something on the wrong layer? Can I just go through a specific platform? Just fall down into the ground. So, we can put some rings, some rings, in here, for those who actually go out of the slope like super fast. And some consolation prizes over here for those who don't go too fast. Then again, it's more about jumping. Right, let's just add a couple of detail with these things, and we're gonna be testing out the stage. Those things are vital, man. They add a lot to a stage, let me tell you that. It doesn't make your, your platforms look like they're just floating midair. So... Alright. So, holy shit, I can hear some car noises. People are gonna fucking insane. Alright, so let's test the stage, and this will be it. Yeah, I wanna continue this, but I don't think you'll be able to do it now. Let's just keep going. We need to, we need to test all the routes as well, so. There we go, we land on the slope. Now we see the police bot. And I have to keep that in mind. Oh man, oh this is a potential for a glitch. <laughs> you gotta keep that stuff in mind. So we're gonna have to replace that platform. Not replace, just move it around a little bit. And now here you face the thing, and you kill it. Oh, the level ended. <laughs> I guess I had a sign post over there. Well, Amy, that, that ain't right. All right, let's try it again. Okay, there's a sign post somewhere that it isn't supposed to be like here. So let me just move this shit. All right, let's test it. So let's go down here this time. Nice! I like Classic Sonic EX. It ended up being pretty interesting. Can I actually get up there? Yeah. Oh boy, this is a problem. What happened here? So let's check it out and fix it. So, we're, are, we're on layer 1. Is this not? Oh, right, because we need to be on layer zero over here. Yes, because then we don't collide with this thing. Right, right, right. That's a dummy mistake. Let's, get, let's do it. Right, so we gotta wait for that thing. Oh, 
Gonna get sent over here. Oh yeah, this route works. Now let's test the other ones. Usually by pressing F2 we can reset the stage, but it's quitting for some reason. Let me see, can I see anything over there? Let me actually go for the secrets this time. Let me try something out. If we go fast and then we spin and hit the ground, do we go further? Yes! Oh boy, this is a problem with moving platforms. Yeah, you gotta fix that later. Alright, so we need to try to go for that other route and there we go. We're in it! Ah, there we go. So if we go back, we go over here, we can't reach it normally, so we gotta. Double jump, do a dash, and then double jump. Mm, still can't can get to it, so we might have to do something. Oh, there's a little problem in here. That's kind of kind of weird. So if we go over here. Oh, there we go. Now let's see if we can actually go fast over here. For example, we spin dash. Oh, this is the spin dash, spin dash button. Oh, there's an air speed camp. Uh, yeah, but there we go. We can actually reach some of those rings. So if we spin dash over here. Oh, now I can reach all of them. Cool. There we go, guys. So. What do you guys think? We're going to be continuing this stage. We're going to be making the whole stage. Possibly a boss. I'm not really sure about it, but we're gonna be doing something more with it Maybe adding a gimmick or two So we have something in there Some like projectile launcher so we can you know make a little a Little thing just to show you how it's done and everything now we can actually see the whole level map See how, how it tends trends to fall, flow upwards There we go. So I'm gonna have to go. And I'm gonna be in this stream right now. Uh, thank you guys all for watching. This has been Lecture 5. Uh, I hope to make Lecture 6 soon enough. Those are all like fucking 2-3 to three hour streams, holy shit. I don't know if anyone's gonna be able to get through it, but there's so much information in every single one of them. I, at least I believe that there is. Enough to like get people to make a whole game in Sonic Worlds. So... Let me save. And I'm going to go. Bye.